Good evening, and thank you for attending the latest in a series of public events by the Michael V. Hayden Center for Intelligence, Policy, and International Security. I am Mark Rosell. I serve as the Dean of the Shar School of Policy and Government here at George Mason University, and we are very proud to host the Hayden Center. The Hayden Center, of course, honors its founder, General Michael V. Hayden, who is with us this evening, and the Hayden Center is part of a larger security studies emphasis in the Shar School. Our International Security Studies Master's Degree Program has ranked in the top 10 nationally for four years running in US News and World Report. And I'm very pleased to report that the State Council for the Higher Education of Virginia has approved our proposal to create a new undergraduate degree program in international security and law. We just started advertising the program. Applications are starting to pour in for the fall of 2023. In brief, if you know anyone who has an interest in security and intelligence studies, the Shar School of George Mason is the place to be. For tonight's session, we have over 300 persons signed up from 26 countries from five continents. Within the United States, attendees are here from 30 states and the District of Columbia. Notably as well, we have attendees from 25 colleges and universities in the United States and internationally. So welcome to all, thank you for attending. And it is now my privilege to turn the program over to the director of the Hayden Center, Larry Pfeiffer. Larry. Thank you very much, Mark. It is uh, great to have everybody attending. Hope everyone had a great uh, Thanksgiving over the uh, weekend over the last few days. Um, General Hayden in the audience, uh, welcome to you as well. Uh, the Hayden Center, for those of you who don't know about us, uh, we are here at George Mason. Uh, we put a spotlight on intelligence and the role it plays in supporting policymakers. We do that largely through events like tonight's, which feature prominent experts in the field. Uh, if you want to know about our uh, events first, join our mailing list, go to our homepage, scroll down, and on the right side, you put your email address, hit enter, and then you'll be getting all of the notifications about our events as we plan them. Uh, the event is being live streamed on YouTube, and it's being recorded. Um, YouTube is one of the places where you can find a lot of information about the Hayden Center. We've got a channel there with all the videos of all the events we've ever done. Uh, we're also prominent on other social media like Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And because of what's happening with Twitter, we're apparently also now on Mastodon and something called Post News. We'll see how that all works out. Uh, tonight, uh, there will be time for questions. Um, Michael Morell will indicate uh, to everybody when he's getting ready to start that. Uh, we'd ask that you use the Q&A tool if you're on Zoom. Do not use the chat tool in Zoom. We won't be monitoring that as closely. Uh, keep your questions uh, brief and in the form of a question and let us know who you are. But if you want to be anonymous, that's OK. Just check the little anonymous box in the Q&A tool. Tonight, we're looking at the war in Ukraine against Russian invaders. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the role of intelligence, and particularly declassified intelligence, in supporting policymakers, as well as what intelligence appeared to get right and what they got wrong. Uh, there's also a lot of talk, however, about the ever-increasing volume of unclassified open source or publicly available information and analysis of that material being done by organizations like the Institute for the Study of War. Uh, ISW is producing daily updates on the war in Ukraine. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about that tonight, but they also produce updates daily on the crisis in Iran, and this all follows up on the groundbreaking work that they began back in 2007 on Iraq and later in 2009 on Afghanistan. Their work has directly supported the warfighters in theater and planners here in Washington at command headquarters. Representing that work tonight with us is Fred Kagan. Fred is a senior fellow and director of the Critical Threats Project, another organization that's doing a lot of great work in open source, uh, located at the American Enterprise Institute. He is a contributor to the ISW Russia Ukraine Project. He has been awarded the highest level award anyone can get for his direct service to military commanders in the Afghanistan theater. He's the co-author of the seminal work defining success in Afghanistan and a series of reports under the header Choosing Victory, which recommended and supported the surge in Iraq. He's author of a recent book called Lessons for a Long War, How America Can Win on New Battlefields. Previously, he was an associate professor at West Point and is frequently published in journals like Foreign Affairs and uh, publications like the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the New York Times. Joining him is Carolina Hurd. 
Uh, Carolina is a Russia analyst at ISW's Russia Ukraine project. She is one of the people working hard getting those daily updates out to you. In fact, just as she got on board here tonight, she told us that uh, Fred was busy doing the final checks of the most recent update. She's a graduate of George Washington University in 2021 with a BA in International Affairs, concentration in Security Studies. Her research is focused on international law and Eastern European security, particularly Polish populism. She's done additional research in Russian objectives, geopolitical strategies on NATO's southern periphery. And she's a great example to all the college students who are watching tonight about great jobs that you can get shortly after you get out of college. Uh, Michael Morrell will be moderating. Michael's 30 plus year intelligence uh, professional, spent his career at CIA, starting as an economics analyst and culminating as deputy director and twice acting director of the agency. He notably served as President Bush's intelligence briefer on 9-11, and he was also with President Obama on the day Osama bin Laden was taken down. Today, he's a national security contributor at CBS News, hosts their CBS News podcast, Intelligence Matters, that also airs weekly on CBS News Radio. If you're not subscribing and following that, you're missing out on some great, uh, great weekly podcasts. He's a distinguished visiting professor here at the Shar School and a senior fellow at the Hayden Center. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Michael. Thank you, Fred and Lena, for joining us. Great. Um, thank you, Larry, and uh, thank you, Dean Roselle, for um, those introductory comments. Um, um, Larry, I have to say, in terms of the Thanksgiving weekend, it was a little difficult for me. My Ohio State Buckeyes were destroyed by the Michigan Wolverines, so I'm going to have to live with that for the next um, for the next year. But anyway, welcome to Fred and to Carolina. It, it's Great to be in conversation with you guys. Um, as Larry said, we're gonna focus tonight on something called the Russian Offensive Campaign Assessment, um, which as Larry noted is a daily report on the war in Ukraine put out by the Institute for the Study of War. Um, I see a lot of analysis out there, um, you know, public sector analysis out there um, on the war, and I think um, ISW's Russia offensive campaign assessment is is by far the best. It is it, it is very good? Um, it's it's high quality in terms of the rigor of analysis, the careful drawing of judgments, the provision of real insights, the acknowledgement of uncertainties, and I can go on and on. This is the it's the closest thing that I've seen to kind of the day to day analytic work produced by CIA analysts doing, uh, uh, during a war time period. So congratulations to the both of you for truly a first-rate job. It's, it's the thing that I go to every day first uh, to understand what's happening in Ukraine. So thank you, guys. Um, let, me, let me start by asking both of you just to share a little bit about um, you know, how you came to work on this daily product. Um, and, uh, and and Fred, why don't we start with you? Uh, well, first of all, thank you uh, so much uh, for for having us uh, and for spotlighting this. And uh, thank you for your decades of service to our uh, our nation uh, through some very very difficult times. It's an, it's really an honor to be uh, to be on with you uh, and speaking to this audience. Um, so ISW is uh, celebrating its fifteenth year uh, of existence this year. Um, the Critical Threats Project was found a couple of years after that, and we embarked on the project of trying to uh, assess and analyze and forecast military operations from uh, publicly available information. We built out at ISW a team on uh, Russia-Ukraine in 2014 as the Russians invaded uh, Ukraine for the first time, and we sustained that effort um, ever since. So we've been covering uh, Russia and Ukraine continuously since 2014, as it became apparent that the war or that the war was uh, imminent, um, we began, we, we decided that we were going to do our best to try to help people understand what was going on, which has been our core mission since we were, which since we were founded. Um, and so Mason Clark, the Russia team lead, uh, put together a, a plan and a, and a way of uh, and a methodology for how we were going to cover this, um, which we have been executing in the nine months uh, since then. Uh, we, we, we ran it a couple of days before the war started and rolled right into it. 
Ironically, the one thing we thought we weren't going to be able to do was map this war. Um, and the, the first day of the campaign, we started just sort of putting it on a map because we needed to see it to understand it. Mm -hmm. We realized we had a lot of information, and so we put it out there. And then we discovered, actually, we could. But that was a, that was a surprise. That was a planning assumption we made that was invalid. We <laughs> thought that, that we were not going to be able to map it, and that even if we could, lots of other people would uh, do it better. Um, and that happened, turned out not to be the case, uh, largely because of the fantastic team uh, that Mason put together, including um, Lena and uh, Katerina Stepanenko, uh, who together with Lena is now, they're now the battle captains for this uh, fantastic product. So that's that's how we came to be doing the maps and uh, started put, putting together updates, all just to try to help people understand what was happening. Yeah. And Carolina, how did you get involved in this? Yeah, so I started as an intern at ISW in January, I think just over a month before the invasion happened. Wow, that's good timing. <laughs> yeah, I had about two weeks of normalcy in my internship, um, as normal as it gets with ISW. And then I was plunged into kind of the, the crisis data collection and slowly worked my way into writing updates um, under Mason's mentorship and supervision, started working with Fred. Um, it's been a bit of a blur of a year, but I'm absolutely honored to be here. Um, so yes, still still learning a lot, but... Yeah. So, 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 how is the effort organized, right? I mean, it, it, in my mind, it, this takes a lot of people to do this, you know, you, you know, on a daily basis. So, how's the effort organized? How many people are involved? You know, do you have teams? Do people get days off? Carolina, I want to make sure you're getting, you know, some time off here. Um, so, how does all that work? That that is the question. Um, so it is, our effort is broken into kind of supporting these two main products, the daily update and the map. And the daily update is the product of ISW's Russia team under Fred's supervision, of course. ISW's Russia team at the current moment is four analysts, um, including myself and my co uh, colleague Katya, and we run kind of the update process. We also have a team of researchers and interns who provide support with both the data collection and the writing aspect. So that's kind of the update section. And then the second part of this is our mapping team. So under George Barros, who's our uh, geospatial intelligence team lead, um, he and his team work on the uh, data that kind of refines our control of terrain maps. And these two products are complementary. So our entire effort is broken around writing the updates and producing the maps in a way that is th these co-products for the daily assessment of what's going on in Ukraine. We do our coverage on a rotational basis. So as you've noticed, we have done an update every single day since the invasion of the war, with the exception of Thanksgiving. That was our first day not publishing in 280 days. And in order for this to happen, this means that our team needs to be online on rotational days. So we all get days off, but they're not necessarily Saturday and Sunday um, because we need to make sure we have people online on the weekends. So everyone, this is an incredibly collaborative and close team. We all work together to make sure that we are getting the correct amount of coverage for data and for writing and for producing maps while also trying to get as much rest in between as we can. Um, just a quick question, Carolina. Do, do, do the people working on this on a day-to-day -day basis, do, do you guys understand how important this thing is to anybody who's following this war? Um, because, you know, all the people that I know that follow this war, you know, read this thing religiously. Do you guys, do you guys appreciate that? We, we definitely have our moments where we'll be, we'll, we'll kind of realize this is, this is so cool. We'll see our names in, in publications or on TV. And I think those moments, it really hits us. But on the day to day, we're all so in the weeds and the data. And it's just be kind of, kind of become our daily, our day to day, our, our daily routine. So it's a little hard unless you zoom out and kind of realize that the impact these products are having. It's very easy to just kind of bury your head in the sand. So yeah. very much, very much appreciate the support. Yeah. Um, um, Fred, maybe this is a question for you. Um, one of the things that that I really like about the daily is, you know, most of the time it's really, you, you know, what's happened in the last couple of days, the last few hours even. But every once in a while, you you step back and you do a bigger strategic look. Um, at at where we are, um, how is a decision made, right? To to take that step back, um, and then how is that different than than the daily product? How is that done differently than the daily product? So so thank you. Um, it's 
there's a process that you will be, I think, very familiar with that starts with the most granular assessment of what is going on and the map drives that because the the team the methodology that george barrows put together at the start of all of this is actually a methodology that lets us say yes we assess with various confidence levels the russians are at this end of the village but not that end of the village and it's incredibly granular collection work and analysis that is done to produce that the team then extracts or abstracts from that to, to write the text that goes in what we call the axis sections, the Eastern counteroffensive, the various sections of the report. And then we have a meeting every day that as Lena uh, alluded to, where we talk about what are the top lines for that day, that's a further level of synthesis of what are the bigger stories, what are the things that don't fall under any of the axis or how do we bring things together? And in those meetings, we have conversations where we say, you know, what context is missing? or are there forecasts that we had made earlier that did or did not pan out? And can we explain why? Or where do we see the debate going? Where do we see the public discourse going? And how can we help people understand what's going on better? Um, but it's really, I think, about what context is missing. What context can we add to the debate? Or what level of synthesis can we do? Because as you know, I mean, when you do this stuff day in and day out for 280 days, you build up a, a sort of reservoir of context that most readers won't have because people are not as immersed in it. And so we make a conscious effort to think about what's in our heads, what is the context that we have that actually our readers could benefit from understanding, or what is a topic that deserves a deep dive. Um, so as an example, we published a special edition on Sunday that Grace Mappis, who's another um, researcher on the team, uh, pulled together using a lot of satellite imagery and other things to say you know, these are the Russian defensive positions in eastern Kherson, um, because it's it tells us a lot it, about what the Russians are thinking and right. what the Russians are preparing for, and we want to help people um, forecast. We want to help people anticipate where things are going. But there's one thing we haven't mentioned, which is very important, and I, I want to make it clear. We, at both at CTB and ISW, we have a general policy. We don't collect on blue. So we don't collect on what US forces are doing. We don't collect on what our allies are doing. And we specifically don't collect on what the Ukrainians are doing. And we don't attempt to forecast what the Ukrainians are gonna do because we, want, we don't want to harm the Ukrainian efforts. So we also therefore ask ourselves, what can we look at what the Russians are doing and report out on what the Russians are doing to help people see what might be coming without running the risk of ticket tipping the Ukrainians' hand at all. Right. Right. Interesting. Um, so so that's a great transition to 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 the information base, right? Um, and 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 what are the key sources of information? Um, how did you identify them, right? Um, how do you assess the credibility? of the sources and the information that you're getting and how has all that evolved over time, right? Over the last nine months or so. So this is a question that we get a lot. And the, the, the question that we get the most is like, what is your one source? And the answer to that is we don't have one source, which mm -hmm. I think is part of the reason these products work so well. And that's a good um, answer by the way a, too. Yes. <laughs> we, if we it was one source would be a problem. Correct, correct. Yeah. Um, we, we pull from a wide variety of both Ukrainian and Russian sources. So the Ukrainian general staff, their daily sit reps are kind of our bread and butter because we're able to tell the way that the Ukrainian government is presenting uh, certain settlements. So there's kind of the running joke on Russia team that if the Ukrainians stop talking about Russians assaulting a certain settlement, that means that Russians have likely taken the settlement. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of our, our bread and butter um, because it helps shape our understanding of the way that Ukrainians are presenting information on control of terrain. We also look at the Russian MOD, the Ministry of Defense, that they are notoriously untruthful. Um, and this kind of gets into the evaluating veracity of sources. We know that the Russian MOD doesn't tell the truth. They claim that they've taken control of the same settlement eight times over the period of two months, right? So we, we know that's not true, but that in and out of itself is very useful because we were able to kind of, if the Russians are telling us one thing, if, if the, the sources are 
you know, pursuing this one line of statements, that in out of itself is valuable. So we, we pull from kind of the, the main Ukrainian and Russian government sources, and then the rest of the nuance in the sources that we look from look look at comes from social media sources, namely Twitter and Telegram. So Telegram is where we get our insights into the Russian information space, which is the group of individuals that my brilliant colleague has dubbed the mill bloggers. So these are the Russian, um, the Russian hyper hyper nationalist Russian commentators. A lot of them are military correspondents, and Katya. Uh, came up with a very nice term to fit all of these guys into. And these are our mill bloggers that we check every day. They're telegram channels. They uh, provide us with guidance on kind of the way that the information space is responding to Russian operations, um, dissatisfaction, that sort of thing. And then we also use um, quite heavily the, the geo confirmation communities on Twitter to refine our map changes. So we there's a lot of times uh, Ukrainian units will post combat footage and then some very, very brilliant humans on Twitter will go through and geolocate that footage, and we'll be able to use that to refine our maps and our control of terrain. So it's, it's essentially a mix of uh, official govern government sources with the social media sourcing, and then, of course, Western statements made by various Western defense officials, um, but all entirely open source. And these lists have been built out over time. Our, our, the sources we pull from started much smaller back in February and March. And just kind of as we've observed things change and voices take prominence, we've added to the, the individuals that we observe, the, the sources that we check every single day. So I always assumed that you guys were looking at commercial imagery. Is that, is that not right? We yes, do, I do, think we, so. Yeah, we do look at that commercial imagery. We, uh, um, a lot of it is available on, uh, you know, is, is, uh, made available on social media in various different ways. Um, but we also uh, work with Maxar Technologies and uh, use uh, the imagery that they make available. Uh, we do, we sometimes purchase imagery. We do uh, work heavily with uh, with that community as well. Gotcha. Um, and then um, there's, there's a number of private organizations that from time to time have intercepted unclassified Russian you know, communications um, on the battlefield. Do you do you tap into that as well? So the the Ukrainian main or the main intelligence director of the Ukrainian um, armed forces releases audio intercepts um, on a nearly daily basis from intercepted phone calls. These are all publicly available uh, phone calls of Russian soldiers kind of complaining home about the the conditions on the battlefield. We leverage those sort of sources that are released by um, Ukrainian government, um, as well as sometimes Russian sources kind of releasing this sort of information to get more of an idea of um, what Russian soldiers are talking about on the ground. Those, those can be really helpful nuances. But we're, one of the things that we've, we've really focused on doing and that the team has been amazingly good at this is as Lena said, we draw from a lot of sources and we look for what we can corroborate. So, I, I trust the Ukrainian MOD and the GUR when they are releasing this stuff. I trust that it's that it's legitimate. We have no ability to authenticate it. And so we prefer to be able to corroborate it uh, before we rely too heavily on it. Um, and we we make note of that. And it's one of the things that you you observe, Michael, in your in your introduction, that we do try to make it clear when we feel that we've been able to corroborate a particular report as opposed to when we have a single source um that is not you know clear satellite imagery of something um so we really we're very alive to the complexities of the information space and all of the traditional problems that intelligence tradecraft over the years has been developed to address um so Karen, fred earlier gave us you know this the kind of big picture of of how this works every day right the the, the meeting the, the discussion of the themes and but I want to know about, you know, the writing of the product, you know, is that just one person who does that? Um, and then, you know, a larger group looks at it. Is it a, it, is it a collaborative effort between a couple of people? And then the larger group looks at it. How does that, how does that actual analytic and writing process work? Lena, we can't, I can't hear you anyway. I think you're on mute. Yeah. 
Um, I can answer the question while Lena works on this if you want, or we can go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go go ahead. Uh, so it's a very collaborative process, actually. The team um, works in a single collaborative document, and um, they're all of the writers for the day um, will be writing different portions of the update uh, at the same time. And then they will um, review each other's work. The peer editing process is, uh, is very central to maintaining the uh, QAQC. Um, and then as that is completed, the battle captains for the day, Lena and uh, Katya, um, or whichever one of them is on, will, will do a, a whole other run uh, through and make sure that all of the sourcing is accurate and, and, and you know the judgments and so forth. So there are multiple layers, but it's a fully collaborative process for all of the writers and everyone can see everybody typing um, all the time. Uh, and Lena's computer just crashed, so she will work to get back in uh, to the program. Okay. Um, and then do you do a final look every day, Fred? I do. I do. Either I or Mason Clark, uh, the, the team lead, one or the other of us, um, we will we'll go through the product every week. One or the other of us will lead a daily sync meeting, and then one or the other of us will do a final QAQC check on the product before it goes out every day. Great. Um, so, so I want to switch gears a little bit here to get your sense on um, kind of where we are in the war itself. And maybe the best place to start is to ask you, you know, strategically, how would you describe the battlefield today? You know, where are the lines compared to where they were the day before the invasion um, in February? Are the Ukrainians still recovering territory or are we at a stalemate? How would you describe the battlefield today? Um, well, we're not, we're not at a stalemate. I can, uh, I can share my screen, um, and show you where it is at. Can you see that? Okay. Yes. Got it. Um, so the Ukrainians, uh, as, as you know, uh, launched the big, uh, Kharkiv counteroffensive that cleared most of Kharkiv Oblast, um, and then more recently, uh, retook all of Western, uh, Kherson Oblast here in the South. Um, and that uh, was completed relatively recently. Um, and both sides are in a period of slight lull um, as they're repositioning forces. Um, one of the things that I find interesting, though, is that the Russians launched a counter or launched an, a new offensive operation in Donetsk um, Oblast toward the unoccupied areas of Donetsk Oblast even as uh, they were in the process of beginning the retreat from Kherson Oblast. And we speculated in, uh, in our update that um, the new or relatively new Russian overall commander, uh, General uh, Surovikin, may well have had to promise Putin that he would take the rest of Donetsk Oblast or do something mm. um, in exchange for Putin's permission to withdraw from Kherson uh, which it seems pretty clear Putin really didn't want to have happen. So it is not a stalemate in the sense that both sides are are not trying actively to uh, advance. Um, the Russians have been in an offensive operation that just isn't going very far on the whole um, because it's not because I frankly because I think the assess the Russians don't actually have a lot of offensive capability at this point, even with their mobilized reserves uh, showing up. The Ukrainians have been continuing counteroffensive operations in uh, the north, pushing toward uh, Luhansk Oblast here. Um, it's been extremely muddy. Um, it, the, the, if, if you've seen any of the pictures on social media of what it looks like, or particularly around Bakhmut, which has gotten a lot of attention, uh, the, the, the climate has just been very hostile to rapid advances. Um, but the fighting has continued and advance, uh, attempts to advance have continued. And we're now entering a period where it's getting very cold. Um, and people have a, have a misunderstanding of the climatology and its effect on war in this theater. And I think it's important to clear that up. Um, for one thing, it's important to remember that the Russians and Ukrainians live here. So they know what the climate is like and their armies are designed to function when it's really muddy and they're designed to operate in extreme cold um, because it is really muddy and extremely cold every year. 
So this is not a surprise for them. And when people talk about, you know, Napoleon in 1812 and the Wehrmacht in 1941, they're forgetting that it was Russian troops that defeated Napoleon in 1812 fighting in the winter because they know how to do that. And the same thing, you know, Russian Soviets repeatedly launched counteroffensives in the winter and so on because they live there. Mm -hmm. Here, in this case, when it gets really cold, the ground freezes. And frozen ground is super for tanks. And this is beautiful tank country. This is about the best tank country in the world outside of the Iraqi desert. So as the cold uh, takes hold, as that mud freezes, uh, I do think that we're likely to see a significant uptick in uh, mechanized maneuver warfare again, uh, because the, the climatological conditions are going to permit it. Um, and both sides, I think, are preparing for that. So I don't think this is stalemated at all. I think the Ukrainians have more gains to make and the Russians uh, are putting more effort into this fight. So I think there's a lot of fighting that's going to be coming up in the next few weeks. Um, so, so Fred, how would you characterize the, the strengths and weaknesses of each side in terms of where we're at at the moment? So this is a war of free people, Ukrainians, against a really an enslaved population. And that has shown in every aspect of the conflict. When the Russians invaded, Ukrainians didn't call back to Kyiv and ask what they should do. They started shooting back at the Russians. And when they called, and they did, they got they hopped on their cell phones, but they didn't generally call back to headquarters and ask for directions. They called their friends. They called people that they knew in civil society. And they said, hey, there's Russians here. I'm shooting at them. I need X, Y, and Z. Can you get me that? Mm -hmm. And they activated a civil society mechanism that they had been deliberately building for many years. And they started calling their friends in Ukraine, and they called their friends in the US. They called their friends in Europe. They said, the Russians are here. We need this. We need that. We need the other thing. And people started making things happen. I would put it this way. The Ukrainians behaved and, in general, are behaving the way most Americans like to think that we would behave in a similar situation. They behaved like a free people that doesn't ask for orders or directions, starts trying to do the right thing, and then calls everybody that they know and says, let's make this happen. And that's what they did. The Russians did the exact opposite. Uh, the one place where Putin has really succeeded in rebuilding the Soviet Union is in the Russian military. And he's done that in a couple of ways. One is by turning it into a vast kleptocracy. But in the other respect, Russians, the Russian soldiers, Russian junior officers will not operate without explicit, direct, clear orders. And when they don't know exactly what to do, they don't do anything. Mm -hmm. This is one of the reasons why there are so many Russian senior officers and general officers killed in this war. Because in order to get their guys to do anything, senior Russian officers have had to move forward toward the front line to put their boots in the butts of their guys and actually make them go do things. And whenever those whenever those guys go down, whenever things get confusing, they, they'd stop. So that is the fundamental huge advantage that a free people has over an unfree people. And then of course you have the advantage that the Russians are in fact engaged in a genocidal project in Ukraine and the Ukrainians understand that. Um, I have no idea how your average Russian soldier feels about this, but I would be willing to bet that this isn't something that they're particularly enthusiastic about. Whereas Ukrainians are very enthusiastic about not losing a genocidal war. So the motivation for Ukrainians is extremely strong and it's much stronger than it was for the Russians. And one final thing to note, in addition to building on civil society, Ukrainians have worked in the period from 2014 uh, to now to try to bring their military toward NATO standards. And NATO has helped them. So US uh, personnel have been helping advise and train Ukrainians. Canadians were there, Brits were there, lots of NATO partners were there, and the Ukrainians were learning. So the Ukrainians have been benefiting from 
very inexpensive and relatively limited training um, and advisory assistance over these years, which has been incredibly important and impactful in helping them prepare to fight in the optimal way against what is fundamentally still a Soviet-style army. Yeah. How would you, Fred, Fred, how would you describe uh, the strategic and tactical goals of each side at the moment? So the strategic, the Russian strategic goals, we assess the Russian strategic goals have not changed. Um, Putin launched this war with the intent of changing the regime in Kyiv. Yeah, Peskov is the Kremlin spokesman. Peskov has since denied that, but it's evident that when you add up what the Russian demands are, they amount to regime change um, and permanently uh, regaining de facto control over all of Ukraine um, and eliminating Ukraine as an ethnicity. And Putin says this himself clearly. He, de he denies that there is any such thing as Ukrainian ethnicity. And his uh, mouthpieces are even more egregious in their articulation of explicitly genocidal aims. And of course, the Russians are pursuing an ethnic cleansing campaign. They're, they're moving Ukrainians out of Ukraine. They're moving Russians into Ukraine. Um, and I hope that we can get uh, Lena back to talk about um, the work that she's been doing, tracking what the Russians are doing with children, the mass deportations of children and, and forced adoptions of children into Russian families to Russify them. So the Russians haven't given up on any of that. That is the that is the aim that they're still pursuing. Ukrainian aims haven't changed either. Uh, Ukrainians didn't initiate this war. They started fighting to defend themselves, and then they sought to regain uh, the control of all of their territory under inter international law and liberate all other people. That is what they're still trying to do. They haven't expanded their aims at all. Uh, they've no they've stated given no indication whatsoever that they think that they're entitled to any territory in Russia or anything else like that. Uh, so they are engaged in a defensive war to try to re liberate all of their territory and they haven't changed their view on that either. Is Crimea part of that for them? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Crimea is a legally recognized part of Ukraine. Um, US government position also, um, as it must be under international law. Um, and the Ukrainians are very clear that they uh, seek to regain Crimea, and of, and of course they do. And by the way, we should want them to, because as much as it is in Ukraine's interest uh, for them to regain control of Crimea, it's also in NATO's strategic interest. And this is something that I think we don't pay enough attention to. Uh, the difference between the Russians have Crimea and they don't have Crimea is a difference of several hundred kilometers closer to the NATO southeastern flank that the Russians can base air defense missiles, anti-shipping missiles, uh, strike aircraft of various different sorts. The threat to the NATO southeastern flank changes dramatically if the Russians do or do not have Crimea. So this is we should we have to stop treating this as just a Ukrainian thing. Mm -hmm. This actually, in many respects, Crimea is the territory most important from the NATO perspective for Ukraine uh, to liberate. What about tactically where we are right now, um, you know, particularly on the Russian side, right, um, since they're so far away from their strategic objective, how are, how's Putin thinking about this from, from a tactical perspective over the next, you know, at least through the winter and into spring? So, I mean, Putin has made, obviously made a lot of mistakes. He didn't mobilize his country for this war because he didn't think he was going to fight a war. He thought they were going to walk in, the Ukrainians were not going to resist. When that wasn't true, it proved not to be true, he took far too long to do anything about it. Um, but he finally ordered a partial mobilization to call up of 300,000 uh, reservists. Those guys are, probably most of them have entered the fight, a lot of them have entered the fight anyway, and they're dying in droves. Um, his response seems to be to be preparing another wave of mobilization. So it, it appears that we will have some more Russian uh, reservists mobilized um, in, in a month or so, um, even as the Russians are completing training of their current uh, fall conscript class. And Putin seems to believe that he can simply bear Ukraine down under the weight of untrained and poorly equipped bodies. At the same time, 
as he has conducted a deliberate campaign uh, to destroy Ukraine's energy infrastructure primarily in hopes, I think, on the one hand of, of freezing Ukraine into submission, although I, I don't know how much confidence he puts in that. I don't think he should have any confidence in that. But I think also hoping to drive a refugee wave of Ukrainians, uh, another refugee, refugee wave into Europe to bring more pain onto the Europeans. Because I do think that Putin's basic theory of the case is that the center of gravity is Western support for Ukraine. And if he can find a way to break Western support for Ukraine, then he can ultimately defeat Ukraine, which is which is probably true. So I think he's looking for, on the one hand, tactical progress in Ukraine, but on the other hand, he's looking for strategic or grand strategic levels, uh, or levers to separate the West from Ukraine uh, so that he can deal with Ukraine on its own. And do you, do you, I know this is a little bit outside the, the daily update, but do you have concerns about the West um, sustaining um, our support? Um, or do you think that that support is solid? I always have concerns. Um, it's, it, it's something that I don't think we can ever take for granted. Um, and the Russians obviously are working hard on weakening it. But I think, look, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. There have been a number of times over the course of the summer, especially when it looked like one European leader or another was really weakening, was, you know, might might really be ready to sort of throw in the towel. And every time, like clockwork, Putin would, would rip off the mask and it would be Dr. Evil part four. So it would be Bucha, or it would be, I've forgotten what all of the various atrocities were in what order, uh, civilian targeting, various other things like that, that made it impossible for Western any Western leader politically, from a domestic political perspective, to cave. And I think that that dynamic continues. I think what the Russians are doing is so evil and so egregious and so obviously evil and egregious that the political appetite in the West for actually surrendering to Putin, I think, is very low. And I think that that dynamic and the fact that Ukrainians are behaving like we would like to think that we would behave, look like us, interact with us in a very recognizable way, are very appealing in that regard. Those factors together, I think, are make it, I think, really pretty unlikely that we're going to see a collapse of Western will over the course of this winter, um, or well in, or well into 2023 anyway. And if I heard you right, um, it would take it would take such a collapse for to open the door for Putin to achieve his strategic objectives. Um, and 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 think about that for a second. And then the other question to ask is for Ukraine to achieve its strategic objectives, are we gonna have to give them more support than we're giving them now, particularly in terms of types of, types of weapon systems? Yeah, I'm, I'm really pretty confident in, in, an, in our assessment that as long as the West continues supporting Ukraine, the Russians will not be able to achieve their strategic objectives. I'm, I'm, I, that's a high confidence assessment. Um, and it doesn't really matter how many bodies Putin tries to mobilize over the next year. It would take much longer than that for him to build the conventional military capability to, to offset uh, Ukrainian will and our support. Um, in order for Ukraine to uh, regain all of its territory, we certainly will have to continue the current level of support. Um, I expect we will need to increase it. Ukraine needs more than we are giving it. That's been true all along. Um, on the one hand, I, I, it's important to give the Biden administration a tremendous amount of credit because without the assistance that they provided Ukraine, uh, Ukraine wouldn't be uh, here. Uh, Ukraine wouldn't be where it is. Uh, and they've made the heroic defense that the Ukrainian people have been conducting possible uh, by providing the aid. But they've also been more hesitant than I would have been. Um, slower with systems, more cautious about what systems they provide. Um, which I think is slowed down and is protracting the war, actually. So it does matter. And I would like to see the administration lean into helping the Ukrainians take advantage of the momentum that they have in the current situation 
um, to uh, to make the gains while they while they really can, and before we have to have very you know more difficult conversations about how long the West is willing to sustain this and how long the Ukrainian people are willing to continue to suffer as they are uh, in this circumstance. So I think it's very very important to lean into this effort of supporting Ukraine as as much as possible. You know, one of the things one of the things Fred that I struggle with is trying to understand um, our own strategic objectives here. Um, I don't think the administration, at least in my, I haven't seen it articulate our strategic objectives. And I'm wondering, um, based on their actions and the actions they've taken in terms of the support they've provided, in terms of what they've done internationally, in terms of sanctions, um, in terms of the rhetoric they've used, if you have a sense of what our, our strategic objectives here are um, and whether or not you agree with those. Or you find it as difficult as I do to, to sort of understand what we want here at the end of the day. Look, on the one hand, I think the administration uh, from the president on down have made a number of very clear and explicit and appropriate statements about what the objective is, which is to help Ukraine liberate its territory. and. They have been really pretty unequivocal about that. Um, and that's that's very good and very important to say. And in that sense, that since I do think that that actually should be the objective, um, since I do um, think that that's the right objective, I'm, I'm very glad that they've said that unequivocally. And then they've said a, a few things uh, that have been less unequivocal. Um, and have raised some questions about how committed they actually are to that. Um, I'll, wrap, I'll wrap this up quickly so we can give Lena a chance actually to, to comment on any of these things um, by just saying what I think the administration has not said clearly enough is how very much in America's interest it is for Ukraine to finish the task it has begun of destroying the conventional Russian military and fundamentally destroying the Russian conventional military threat to NATO for quite a long time. We're seeing play out the scenario against which NATO has been preparing its military for decades. It's just that it's not playing it out in NATO territory. It's playing it out in Ukraine and NATO troops aren't fighting and dying. Ukrainians are fighting and dying. Um, we, can, I, I feel very ambivalent about our moral position in all of this in a certain fundamental sense, because Ukraine is fighting our war. Um, and it is our war because Putin's objectives didn't stop with Ukraine. Putin's stated demands uh, before the invasion included fundamentally dismantling NATO in a very profound way. So this war has always been about more than Ukraine. It's also been about NATO, and Ukraine is fighting for more than Ukraine. Ukraine is also fighting for NATO and for us. And I think the administration could do a better job of being explicit about that. Carolina, welcome back. Are you with us? Hello. I'm so yeah. sorry for no, all No worries. No worries. No worries. It's great to have you back. Um, I wanted to ask you a question specifically, which is um, one of the issues that you guys have focused on is the forced deportation of Ukrainian children to Russia. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I don't think that has gotten enough attention in the in the mainstream media. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and then the broader issue of Russian attacks on uh, Ukrainian civilians? Yes, of course. So the, the specific issue of the forced deportation and adoption of children um, from Ukraine and Ukrainian um, families into Russian families has been something that I've been personally tracking very closely. And the thing that is remarkable about this whole situation is how blatant the the Russian officials in charge of this campaign are. We see very, very proud proclamations from Russian sources, from even Russian officials, even the Russian um, commissioner on children's rights herself on this, this, what seems to be systematic process of taking children from Ukrainian homes, Ukrainian territories, under the guise of some sort of rehabilitation camps or rest camps, 
and bringing them to Russia and adopting them into Russian families. And there's so much sourcing on this because Russian mill bloggers proudly talk about this, Russian officials proudly talk about this. And we've seen it kind of play out over time with Russian regional officials confirming that they've, they have children from Mariupol up for adoption and welcoming these, these efforts for, by Russian families to basically take and forcibly assimilate Ukrainian children. And we've, we've been quite clear in that elements of this amount to violations of the convention of genocide conventions, as well as some sort of deliberate ethnic cleansing depopulation campaign. And this is something that we're gonna to continue to, to uh, track very closely um, because it, it is very nefarious and very scary to watch this happen. It's also just scary to see how flagrant Russian officials are with the discussions of this. In terms of the strikes on civilian infrastructure, um, we have assessed and we continue to assess that it seems that Russians are choosing the, the psychological impacts of striking civilian infrastructure and creating this sort of terror effect um, over really trying to target uh, military assets that would generate some sort of asymmetric battlefield effects. So we've seen this, this time and time again with the strikes on critical energy infrastructure, civilian infrastructure. These things don't necessarily directly contribute to battlefield gains and are much more psychological and terror-based. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's go to questions here. Um, uh, this question is from a uh, former CIA officer who asks, um, have you experienced or are you at all worried about Russian active measures against you guys and against what you're doing since you know, it has become kind of the go-to place for an understanding of what's happening in the war? You, you know, are you worried at all about, um, you know, denial and deception efforts vis-a-vis -vis ISW? Kind of an interesting question. Um, let me break it into two pieces. In terms of actual uh, measures against us, uh, yes, we have. Yes, we are. And that's all that I'm going to say about that. Um, in terms of um, active measures to shape our coverage, uh, yes, we see that too. Um, and we are, on the one hand, highly amused when the mill bloggers um, cite our material and uh, interact with it in various different ways. Um, that's happened on quite a few occasions, and, and it delights us in many respects. Um, but it also keeps us constantly alive to the uh, reality that they read our stuff too, and they we you know we report on what they say, and they read our stuff, and there is always a risk that we can get into a cycle there where they're actually deliberately trying to influence us. Um, and so we guard against that the way that anyone else would by being alive to the sources and, and corroboration and just being very sensitive to the fact that we're operating in a highly contested, very hostile information environment um, where there are messages delivered aimed at us and messages delivered aimed at others that uh, are intended to shape things and we we just do our best to balance all of that stuff out and be aware of it all the time. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, so, question about um, your your insight, your degree of insight into casualty figures. Um, you know, with regard to the Russians, Russian casualty figures in Ukraine. Here, Lena. Yeah, so this is a this is a bit of a challenge because the Ukrainian general staff has their figures, and I think it, it, it's generally that that's kind of generally what we defer to. But in our own understanding, we can't necessarily individually corroborate that because both sides make claims on kind of casualty counts in such a way that it, the 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 numbers we get are so contradictory and overlapping that it, this is something that we we try to stay away from as much as we can. Um, I'm not sure if Fred has any sort of additional insight on that, but I, I tend to be very cautious with casualty counts, both on the Ukrainian and the Russian side, regardless of the source, because of how busy and, and chaotic the information space can be. Um, it, it, these are really difficult numbers to corroborate, and we don't really want to be um, giving kind of a false sense of 
casualty numbers because we can't independently confirm them necessarily. Yeah. Fred, anything you want to add there? No, nope, Lena nailed it exactly right. Great. And then and, and this is a question for me. Um, to what degree do you monitor, you know, you you monitor these um these mill bloggers, as you call them. Um, to what degree do you monitor politics in Russia with regard to the war, right? And how has that evolved? Go ahead, Lena. So the our, our main source for kind of understanding of politics in Russia is really the mill bloggers, because the mill bloggers mount very, very specific critiques against Putin, against the Kremlin, against the MOD, et cetera. So our, our kind of understanding of the of politics and the way that the the war has especially had domestic impacts largely comes from the mill bloggers because they are very unafraid to share exactly how they feel. And these are major inflections and trends that we can track over time that kind of shape our understanding of the information space. And we understand the information space is a microcosm of certain social factors. So kind of through developing those assessments, through monitoring those sources, we have been able to build out our understandings of the political system in Russia. Interesting example of this is kind of the, the resurgence of our, our favorite um, Wagner group financier, uh, Prigozhin, who he, he's kind of inserted himself into Russian politics um, in the last few months. And we've been able to really track this rise through the way that mill bloggers discuss him and you know his insertions into local politics in St. Petersburg, uh, et cetera. So that's been a, a really interesting um, set of sources and the way that they've developed our assessments and our understanding of the social ramifications of this war on a domestic scale. So um, Warren Strobel, a, a, a journalist, um, Wall Street Journal uh, journalist um, asks, um, what's the difference between what you guys do, right? And what, what CIA analysts are able to do? Obviously, you guys don't know the answer to that question, right? Um, but, but Warren's premise here is that it looks like, right, the gap is closing between what a national intelligence agency is able to do um, and what somebody is able to do with open sources. Um, and I guess, you know, I don't know what, what, what CIA's analysis looks like on the Ukraine war either, but I would imagine that there's not a lot of daylight between what you guys are saying in terms of how the battlefield's going and, and, and what CIA is saying. That would be my guess. I don't know if you guys want to want to comment on that at all. Yeah, I will. I mean, I, you know, I did have the opportunity while I, you know, I was in Afghanistan to, to get a look behind the curtain and also I had the privilege of being on the CIA uh, external advisory board when General Petraeus was director. Uh, so, I mean, I, I have an understanding, I think, of what that analysis and what those sources look like in general terms, not obviously on this war. Um, there are, look, the first thing that I need to make clear, because this also was, came up in another question, and I can, I can fold it in here. We don't have any sources of our own. We don't run human sources in Ukraine. Uh, we don't do our own collection in Ukraine. We rely on publicly available information exclusively, um, and those, that's a matter of policy. Um, that means a bunch of things. It means that we don't have taskable assets. It means that we can't send queries in and get them answered. And then there's a whole panoply of things that I don't need to tell you about um, that we don't have access to that the intelligence community does. And I think we've gotten a pretty good sense over the years of what kinds of things you can only do with exquisite intelligence capabilities and what kinds of things you can do with publicly available information. Um, we can track the course of the war, you know, day to day, village to village, uh, pretty well with the information that is available. We can, as Lena indicated, establish proxies for political developments in Russia based on what is observable and publicly available information, but I would hope and expect that the intelligence community would have exquisite sources that would give it a much better insight into internal Kremlin dynamics. And I'll give you one superlative example, and I think in I should have led with this because I usually do. 
we were fundamentally wrong about one very important thing before this war. We assessed that Putin wasn't going to invade. Now, we part of the reason we were wrong about that top line assessment was because we were right about the underlying assessment, which is that if he did, it would be a mess for him. Uh, we made the mistake of thinking that he knew that or that he cared. But I've spoken with other with other NATO countries and various other people who've given me some indication of some of the reasons why the US government was so confident that he was going to invade. And in fact, even at the time, you know, you were see, was seeing reports in newspapers and hearing things, people saying, no, 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 there really is information. And we had, this was a hard call because I was basically, you know, seeing enough about leaks from in the intelligence community and so forth that said, we really did have something that suggested he was going to go. We set the team the question, can we find anything in open source action to support that? And the answer was no. And so we said, okay, well, we're open source and intelligence organizations. We're going to give you the assessment that is available from open source, and I'm not going to try to, to hedge it based on hints that I'm hearing. So in that case, it was very clear that there are things that exquisite intelligence can do that publicly available information cannot do, um, or at least if it can, we didn't do it well enough. And that's going to continue to be the case. So I think from our perspective, we are not trying to compete with the intelligence community, which would be foolish. Um, we think that there is a huge amount of benefit that the intelligence community can derive from the open source ecosystem um, that it does not need to generate on its own. And my one concern, as I, there's a lot of enthusiasm, growing enthusiasm to have the intelligence community use more and more open source intelligence, and, and I'm in favor of that, but I have a concern which is that there are things that only exquisite intelligence can do, and only the intelligence community can do those things. And I'm very worried that if the enthusiasm for having the IC do too much OSINT goes too far, it will end up crowding out the functions that only the IC can perform. Because guess what? You can't pay us. Our policies are we, we won't take money from the government. So we're a zero budget item for the intelligence community use us we're doing the, the publicly available information as we do it other it's a very robust ecosystem draw on that and then continue to focus ic assets on the things that only the ic can do fred you and i are in exactly the same place on this issue i worry greatly about you know um pushing the ic into that open source world and not really recruiting the assets right who are going to give us that 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 precious information um, question here about, about the use of tactical nuclear weapons. How concerned should we be? <laughs> Anytime somebody starts talking about using nuclear weapons, one should be very concerned. Um, that of course is the, is the point. Um, I think there are scenarios in which it would make sense of a sort for Putin to use tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, I think they are much more limited than a lot of people imagine. Fundamentally, I think that if the Russian army uh, came under attack in Ukraine in such a way that it actually imploded, began to collapse, and U Ukrainian forces were basically racing toward the border, uh, chasing a, a collapsed and destroyed Russian military, I could imagine Putin deciding that he needed to use an array of tactical nuclear weapons to stop the Ukrainian advance and do something. I don't know what at that point. Um, it, would be a, it would be a spread of weapons. There's not a circumstance in which I could see it making sense for him to use a weapon. Mm -hmm. So he would have to be prepared to conduct a theater tactical nuclear campaign. And there are all kinds of problems for him domestically and internationally for doing that. Um, Beginning with, and this is very important, I have high confidence assessment, this Russian military cannot operate on a nuclear battlefield. The Russian army, in theory, is, is trained and equipped to operate on a, on a nuclear battlefield. This Russian military is not capable of operating on a nuclear battlefield. He will be irradiating his own guys. He will also, by using tactical nuclear weapons, create no-go areas for his army that they will not be able to advance into. And since his aim is continues to be to advance, that would be a huge problem for him. So I can see circumstances in which he might decide that he would use tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine 
to stave off a complete catastrophic defeat. Um, although even then, I'm not sure. Um, but short of that, it's hard. It's hard for me to see a, re, uh, a circumstance in which he, I think he's likely to use them. And I should be clear. I think there is virtually no circumstance in which he uses nuclear weapons against NATO. That's I just he is he's not Hitler. He's not in this sense. He's not interested in having an apocalypse and ending the world um, when the stakes are what they are here. So another question. Um, uh, one of my students actually notes that you know we're 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 nine to ten months into this now, um, and asks what are the what are the analytic questions that are proving the most difficult to answer um, about where the war is and where the war might be going. It's an interesting question. Lena, do you have any thoughts? I'm. Um, I think we've been reckoning a lot with kind of how what what are Russian capabilities to take more territory, um, especially around Donetsk, um, especially around Bakhmut. That's been kind of the hot the hot button issue over the last weeks. Um, there there seems to be gains um, that that are made in small villages, et cetera. But we're kind of reckoning with, you know, maybe they can take a. a a village that amounts to a couple blocks across, but is that really going to be enough to turn to turn a larger village, that sort of thing? So just kind of reckoning with, we know that their capabilities are bad and degraded and constantly stretched thin, but what is the extent of that and how is that going to continue to wear on as the war continues to wear on? That's been a, a analytical reckoning that I've had quite a bit because we always end up back at point A with Oh, they took this very small village south of Bakhmut, but what does that really mean for the 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 rest of the offensive in Donetsk? That sort of question. Yeah. I think you put your finger on a really on uh, on on what is actually one of the most fascinating challenges that I think everybody's been having, which is how do you do actual net assessment? How do you do actual assessment of combat capability and effective combat power in a circumstance where Morale is playing a huge role. Leadership organization is playing a huge role. The Russians are in, you at this point, completely non-doctrinal organizations. Um, we were, we were uh, appreciated the UK MOD's report today that the Russians aren't even trying to deploy battalion tactical groups anymore, um, which basically, I mean, it looks like it's more or less of a morass of, of conscripts and, and uh, mobilized troops they're throwing together into ad hoc formations. How do you assess the combat power of an ad hoc formation like that? I think this is one of the things, I'm, without knowing anything about what was going on in the IC, I think this is one of the things the IC probably struggled with before the war that probably got to some of the uh, assessments about the likelihood with which the Russians would succeed or that they would succeed. We've been, I think, frankly, I mean, generally more accurate about that. And one of the reasons why I think we were is because we've been very focused on the effects of organization and morale and leadership and training and preparation on combat power, but I can't give you any equations and I can't tell you how to run that in stochastic models uh, to do this kind of thing. And that to me is a fascinating analytical tradecraft issue that um, I would love to explore uh, further and talk with some of the people who've had to work it on the other side. Yeah, yeah. let me ask one more question. <laughs> um, and it's really, um, it's really an observation and, and, and ask both of you to comment on it. Um, you know, in terms of, of, of giving young people um, a huge amount of responsibility, um, you know, to, to do incredibly important work, um, you know, there's a there's a there's a similarity here between what ISW is doing um, and what the intelligence community does. Um, you know, as Fred, as you know from 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 being on the board, right? Some of those analysts who stood in front of you and gave you briefings were were you know just out of school. Um, and just just get you guys to react to that because I see exactly the same thing here. Well, I'll give you my perspective, and Lena can can end by giving you hers, which is. That is our talent model. Uh, we we take we generally take people right out of school. Um, it usually initially as interns and then um, and then as analysts, sometimes directly as um, 
as researchers and analysts. And I think it's all about tradecraft training, education, and creating an environment um, in which you are focused on developing young people. Um, the one profession for which I'm actually professionally qualified is to teach. Mm. Um, and I do see myself at the end of the day fundamentally as a teacher. It's what I enjoy doing, and I, I think I'm really pretty reasonably good at it. Um, and we have, um, and, and of course, we have a program at uh, at ISW, the Hurtog War Studies Program, um, of which Lena is uh, an alumna, um, where we institutionalize this and we uh, try to help teach young people how to understand military operations. We have a whole curriculum developed for doing this. This is something we've been investing in for the whole, our whole existence. Um, and ISW has always had an educational mission at its core. And as you say, I mean, I've uh, at the board that was true when Kim and I went through uh, theaters uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, it's a lot of lot of very young people doing absolutely amazing things because they've been trained uh, to do that and properly supported. And I just have limitless confidence uh, in our amazing uh, young talent to do to do what they do. Nina. I think I would 100% echo everything that Fred has said, and also just the fact that as an intern, and then as uh, when I started out as a researcher, I felt like my my development and my future was always something that was very, very much invested in by the people I considered to be mentors and leader leaders. So that sort of investment in in my own growth has been absolutely massive in letting me kind of realize that my my age and the fact that I graduated when I graduated doesn't really impact my ability when I have the, the baseline that ISW has provided for me. And the fact that, you know, everyone I work with is so open to continuing to grow and learn and develop and and keep keep going and keep pushing. And we're we're all quite young, but I think that that's an asset more than anything, um, because we are passionate and energetic and we will we will be working until, you know, 11 p.m. or midnight um, just as happily as, you know, the next person. So I'd, I'd just like to thank thank everyone who like listens and invests in in us and our team. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. That's a great way to end. Thank you. Thank you both very much for joining us. It's been fascinating. Um, and I'll turn it back to Larry. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fred, Lena. Lena, I'm so sorry the problems you had. Uh, what, what I'll say is apparently today is Giving Tuesday. So if you're not going to give to the Hayden Center, throw a little money to ISW and they can get more of the new laptops that finally allowed Lena to get back on. Um, so um, <laughs> It's uh, it's always a challenge at, at the nonprofits uh, to to maintain the, the that level. But thank you. I think uh, I came in tonight's event excited about the work you guys are doing. I'm even more excited now having heard what you had to say, Fred, and you, Lena, in particular, uh, hearing your uh, enthusiasm for your work and your confidence and your uh, strong analytic ability. Um, maybe we'll have to have you come back for another event to make up for the time we lost uh, here tonight. Uh, for the audience, thank you for sticking with us. This is a rare uh, event where our audience actually grew through the event. So word of mouth must have spread that there was something good happening here tonight. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for the great questions. As always, we didn't get to them all. Uh, for those who enjoyed tonight's event, um, in less than a week, next Monday, we're going to be hosting an event at the National Press Club. Um, we are going to be looking at the Julian Assange case as uh, he faces um, extradition to the United States, probably within weeks or months at most. Uh, we've got a former FBI uh, NSC counterintelligence director uh, who will be on to discuss the case against Assange. We have uh, Barry Pollack, who is Assange's uh, um, defense attorney here in the United States. Uh, we have got um, Gabe Brotman, who is from the Reporters uh, Committee on uh, Press Freedom, who looks at technology and how it applies to these issues. Um, and we've got a great um, moderator in Sasha Ingber, who is from Newsy, which is a great uh, up, uh, growing internet-based news service. So um, come join us at the Press Club. Uh, we will also live stream it for those of you who don't live in the area and can't find it convenient to get to the Press Club in downtown Washington. So you can find information about it on our social media and on our webpage. And with that, uh, on behalf of General Hayden, thank you again. 
Uh, and on behalf of Dean Mark Rozelle of the Shar School, thank you all again for participating. And we'll see everybody next time.